to do that. So John knows when we start and stop. Ah, I'll do message. All right, thank you, Ashley. I really, oh, oh, thank you, Kai. I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say thanks again to everybody for allowing me to push this back by 30 minutes. Um, so I guess we'll probably just get started. I think this is a really short chapter. Uh, I think there's some pretty intuitive bits to it. I also think that there are some things that I can kind of dive into a little bit more to provide a little bit more context and that I found kind of interesting. But um, first and foremost, just kind of talk about the objectives for today. I think first learning objective is to be able to discuss how genomes are the fundamental building blocks of ggplot2. Then be able to draw comparisons between geomes and their associated name plot. And then the last one, take some time to explore each individual geome by reviewing some of their documentation if we have a uh, possibility to do that. I will say as I went through this chapter, um, this is probably the first time I kind of opened up like the geome box plot, geome bar um, documentation and actually read it. And so I thought that was pretty informative. And there's some a couple things that I thought were kind of interesting that I hopefully get to share today. Stop me anytime. If anybody has any questions, jump in. Happy to answer any questions or to explore topics further. Um, just jump in. <laughs> so really, it comes down to the basics when it comes to geomes. Uh, these were kind of from the chapter. First, each geome can be useful by itself, right? You can create a really quick bar plot. You can create a really quick box plot if you just know the specific geome that you need. Also, geomes can be used in ways to construct more complex geomes. And in fact, one of the exercises kind of showed us that if you want to use a geome and then add some additional code to it or an additional function, you can change the format of it. Or you can manipulate the parameters to create some really complex geomes. You just need to know what combinations to actually do that. Also, uh, when we talk about geomes in this case for this specific chapter, we're talking about two-dimensional. So in XY, uh, we talked about this when we first started but we're only talking about geomes that map onto an XY coordinate plane. And then obviously we need to understand that all geomes understand parameters. One of the, uh, one of the kind of main parameters that you'll most likely use is color. For our European people who, uh, I don't know if anybody's from Europe on this call today, but anybody who's watching this later on the YouTube space uh, know that geomes are flexible enough to understand both the English and the European, or it's not English, but the, European um, translation of the word color, and then also size aesthetics is something. And Canadian. What? Oh, it's okay. And Canadian. Great Canadian. <laughs> I gotta include our Canadian uh, people as well. So I I know I know I've had quite a few people from around the world on these calls. So I'm trying to be inclusive of everybody, and ggplot too is inclusive of everybody, which is really kind of cool. Also, bar, tile, and polygon understand the concept of the parameter fill. We'll kind of see that when we look at um, geome polygon. And then also, a lot of these terms are going to translate into parameters or arguments for the specific geome functions. So if you kind of understand what these parameters do in a general sense, when you start using any type of specific geome, they'll translate over to that specific geome. So it's really kind of cool. So the topics are really kind of list-based. So it's going to be kind of a list like, hey, here's this, here's this chart as our notes are going, but let's just kind of start going through this. Uh, first off is geome area. Geome area is mapped onto an area chart. In basic, it draws an area plot, right? It creates a line plot filled to the y-axis, right? What's nice about area charts is not only does it fill, but it also allows you the opportunity to stack multiple groups within the area. So for my examples today, I'm going to lean on the diamonds um, data set. That's a part of the ggplot2 package. Basically, the diamonds data set is just a data set of diamonds, which it gives different kind of characteristics related to it, like carrot, cut, so on and so forth. I like it because it's a big it's a big data set and it gives you kind of a lot of different options both within like numeric data and kind of categorical data kind of play with and it's kind of fun to play with and kind of look at. So I'm going to lean on that a little bit today. So here basically all we're doing is we're using geom area to create an area plot looking at price on the x axis, right? And because um uh, looking at this when we look at the aesthetic, it only takes one column or one variable within our data set to actually create it. 
and then it automatically creates the count for us of how many diamonds are within that specific um, price range. To get a little bit more information, we can lean on the fill parameter, which we can look at the cut. And I think cut is quality when it comes to diamonds. Don't quote me on that. I can look at the documentation a little bit later if we want to. But if we really want to kind of split out that area plot, we can just put in this specific variable for cut, and then it will stack that area plot to kind of show, okay, based on this price range, here is you know where ideal sit. This is where premium sits. So pretty straightforward. Uh, before I move on to the next one, does anybody have any questions or what questions can I answer in regard to geome area as a geome? Has anybody ever used this before in their work? I've never used the area one. I never, for me, it's like I'd rather see a line or a distribution. So then I'm going to use the, um, the other package. Um, I don't remember the name right now, but that does the distribution um, very well. Area, not really. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. like a, a, a use that you can have. But. Yeah, I've never used this like an area chart in my own research i'm trying to think one of the use cases where i've seen it recently is i was looking at um data that was quantifying the amount of energy used in ontario which is where i live um and it was that it was a stacked one chart so each of the stacks was um the uh the type of energy so whether it was like nuclear energy wind natural gas stuff like that so that's an example of where i've seen it used yeah absolutely like income distribution might be a good one because income starts at zero and it moves on so that might be a good place where this gets applied so uh that's what i was thinking too but i don't really look at that kind of data so cool uh, Gion Bar, I'm um, going to kind of go through. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. One more thing. Um, just, I always, uh, I think this is the code. I, ho I hope I'm going to put it in the chat. I hope I put it correctly, but this is a good way to sort of see with all the geons what the default mm -hmm. aesthetics are. So with geom area, for example, when you do this, um, you're going to see, for example, maybe the color is going to be black, the line width or something like that. I don't remember, but that's um, that's a good way to to sort of like because obviously they put some of them um, by default. So if and you try those, it's capitalized like that. Yeah, I know it looks weird, right? But I do remember that it doesn't look like the regular gm underscore uh, line or whatever. Let me try it yeah. here. I have so I have it up. I have it up on my share screen. On, okay. Um, our studio. So this is what the output is right here. So if you go geome area exactly. default aesthetic, that's really cool. Yes. I like that. Yeah. I've, never, so that, I've never seen that. And if you put on go the ahead. console geome area dollar sign, then you're going to see other things that you can access to sort of see what that geome has, uh, you know, for default. So for example, for me, if I just do geome line dollar sign and then hit tab, it tells me, for example, extra params or extra underscore params, set up data and other um, things that I can sort of like go over and see how this is, how the function is defined. I guess that's what I'm trying to say without really going into the function. Yeah, those are, that's, that's excellent. Another tip too, if you use the function args and wrap the function mm -hmm. in it, you can, you can see it too. And then another like, good one that I've used before is if you just do the function without the parentheses, it will output for most functions, as long as they're not using like R6, S3, you can kind of see like the function definition inside of it, which is nice too. So yeah, that's a great tip. I, I love that. Um, I like that args sweet. too. Yeah, perfect. Continue. Yeah, the it. args is awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. so those are, those are great tips. Yeah, if anybody's got tips, like, yeah, spread the word because I love tips so um i'm gonna go over geom bar now bar chart right they're mapping geom bar bar chart i think we're all familiar with the bar chart it's probably one of the first charts we're ever introduced to 
Um, but again, it only takes one uh, column within the aesthetic, which is cut, the geome, geome bar, again, relying on the diamonds data set. It automatically does the aggregation for us. And so basically what we're getting is just a bar chart of the different cuts of our diamonds. So uh, one of the things that trips me up always is stat identity. And probably one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this group was to figure out how the statistics or how the statistics are calculated on the back end of ggplot because it kind of abstracts that away from the user. And so I was like, what's up with the stat identity? Because the book talked about it. And really, when you think about it, the default for geom bar is to count values. And so, but say we have a data set or we want to control what the aggregation is or how it's counted or whatever statistic we want to use, that's where stat identity comes in because that parameter leaves the data unchanged. So say for some reason, I wanted to do my own type of dplyr pipeline here to do my own kind of aggregation, I can do it here. And then if I want to just leave it alone, I just do stat identity in geom bar. It's the same thing, it's the same answer, but because I wanted some more fine grained control of what the aggregation is, that's what I would do it for. Um, I will say my biggest trip up is with stat identity is like, what stat do I call? Like, I think it's really, for me, when I use ggplot2, that's like what I'm always looking up and I'm a little confused about. Um, but this kind of clarified it for me, at least for geom bar, is it, it just leaves the data alone. Um, so, I think bar charts are pretty straightforward. My other kind of consternation with this too is geom call. When do I use geom call versus geom bar? Um, but I think I figured that out and that's kind of in our exercises as well. So next one is geom line. Uh, again, these are pretty straightforward charts, but here's geom line. A useful parameter for this is line type, which changes the different line type. If you're interested in seeing what the line types are, you can click this link here once I get the notes up, but basically it will, in the documentation, it will tell you what the line types are. It has a specific section related to it. And in addition to that, if you're somebody who's more of a documentation focused person, you can do question line type and then read that specific section and it will tell you what the different line types are um, because they're mapped onto specific numbers. Like you have to go line type equals one, two, three, four, whatever. Um, I always get confused on what those are. So I have to look them up. But basically uh, with line types, they're just plotting connects points from left to right. Uh, here's an example using a data set called economics, which is another data set that's embedded within ggplot2. It's just economics data focused on like savings, unemployment, some other kind of economics variables plotted or over time. And so basically I'm just on, I'm just plotting unemployment over from like 1960 something to 2015 or something. But this geome is going to require two aesthetics, uh, a date variable, and then unemployment. So what's up with geome path? Uh, basically, geome path is similar, but instead of doing left to right, it connects points based on the order of the data. And so this is related to the answer to exercise two, but there is an example data set that's in the book, which is just a very simple data set. All it really does is it just maps it based on where it's at in the data set. This was a little confusing when I looked at it, but then when I like applied it to the economics data, obviously this, this chart makes no sense and I would obviously not use this, um, but it just kind of shows what geom path does for um, specific variables in the economics data set. And it's doing this because it's based on order, right, within the data set rather than the actual, like, if we plot it over time. Since I'm talking to a bunch of epidemiologists, right? Or ecologists, excuse me, not epidemiologists, ecologists. I was thinking, since you work with animals, again, I am assuming things, maybe tracking data, right? If you're tracking a specific species over a specific longitude and latitude, geome path might be beneficial to you. Yeah, I, I don't want to assume your research, but yeah, go ahead. That's exactly what I do. And yes, I use, I use geompath all the time. It's, it's interesting. You're talking about this and it's almost like, why would you use geom line when there's geom path and you could just order the data by time? So like, I almost always use geom path, but I think that's one of the things that I'm noticing about these is that there are some geoms that are kind of redundant, but they're like shortcuts for other geoms, which I didn't really realize. 
Yeah, and I would I would caution with that because some of the data that I use, like especially because I look over stuff over time, sometimes the data that I get back, and although I would like to arrange it free wrangling steps, sometimes I don't. And so GeoMine just abstracts that process away from me and I don't have to worry about it. So, um, but I will probably never use GeoPath because that's not the data I work with. But obviously in other contexts, it absolutely is and a good tool to use. The other thing that I learned too, if you look at the examples, it's interesting that you can basically do math on your variables in aesthetic. So here it's dividing unemployment by population. And so I was like, that's a really neat trick. So if I need to do like a really quick transformation without doing like a dplyr pipeline to actually create a data set, just do it really quick right in here. So really cool. Uh, yeah, scatter plots. So not all the oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I do that all no, the time. I, I have to do like logarithmic values, uh, like our log transformations a lot. So usually if I'm, especially if I'm just like spitballing ideas, I'll just be like log variable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like if, and that's good example here for when we get to GM point, because sometimes you have variables that have uh, outliers or they're just a distribution is off and it's so good to look at it like a log base 10 or something. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go over scatter plots here real quick. It's just genome point. I think we're all familiar with the scatter plots, um, plotting variables on the X and Y. Uh, here we're looking at miles per gallon, which is another data set that's available in ggplot2. All we're just looking at is displacement, which is engine size, so how big an engine is, and the highway mileage. And surprise, surprise, if you have a larger engine, or there is a slight negative relationship where if you have a larger engine, you're going to have less highway mileage, which is not surprising. What gets really interesting, though, is using like the shape parameter to change the shapes. So say if you wanted to map on a third variable within your plot, what you could do is you could use shape within your aesthetic to kind of break these out into different types of um, uh, number of cylinders within an engine, right? So you have like a V4, or a V6, or a V8. So it's just the number of cylinders within an engine. And so basically, if you wanted to, you could just use shape, factor it here real quick, do cylinder, and then you're starting to see some other relationships where you're starting to see, okay, although we have this negative relationship with highway and engine size displacement, you can see that those larger engines are gonna be an eight cylinder, which makes sense. More cylinders, bigger engine, less highway mileage. So just allows you some more flexibility to create some more complex graphs to kind of examine more complex relationships. And I think it's worth um, noting too that when the shape is inside the aesthetics, it's gonna take the value of a variable. So then it's gonna vary by that variable, right? So then in this case, it's going to be by cylinder. But if you put the shape, if I remember correctly, if you put the shape outside of the aesthetics, you can control the overall shape of your graph. So it's going to be, if you don't want it to be points because scatter points, right? You can have scattered triangles, scattered cats, scattered whatever you want. So that's also worth noting. Yeah, another fun thing to do too is with the shape thing is instead of using a categorical variable, use a like a numeric variable. And you can kind of get what's called a bubble chart. And so you can kind of map that relationship where it's like, you know, I, I'm thinking of the Gapminder data set, right? Um, if you're familiar with the Gapminder data set, which is, and if nobody's familiar with it, I can share it later. But it's basically like, it uses a bubble chart and it maps like a third data set onto it to increase the size or decrease the size of the bubble itself. So some really cool tips. Um, the other thing too, that I found out documentation wise, is there is a documentation called AES line type size shape. So if you're interested in learning more about these specific like components of the aesthetic, if you go question mark shape, question mark size, or question mark line type, it pops up to this documentation that provides more specific detail. And I've read it, it's really helpful. And like, if you just forget something, like I don't know the line type, question mark line, question mark size, it will automatically pull up this documentation that's really helpful to kind of remember what those specific like parameters are so okay so let's see 
Polygons, I don't really use polygons in my work and I'm gonna kind of just for the sake of time, skip over this because the book just says like, hey, this is what it does. We're gonna talk more about it in chapter six, but it really says it's useful in making maps. I mean, if we wanna talk about it more, we sure can, but because we're gonna cover it in a later chapter, I think just for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of say, hey, all it does is it just draws polygons and it fills that polygon. Uh, this isn't talked about in the book, but histograms are obviously super important to some of the work we do. So I thought we probably should cover it and it was in the previous notes before. Um, but here's geome histogram. Again, it's just a geome histogram. There are some parameters to which you can modify the bin size. It defaults to bins 30, but say if you want some more granularity in your histogram, you can set it to, I think the parameter is bin width to like bin with 10, bin with five, or as small as whatever you want it to be. So if you want some more granularity in your histogram, you can do that. Um, but I think we're all pretty familiar with histograms, but I just want to highlight it because the book doesn't really talk about it, but it's a really important data set, especially for numeric variables. So, And then uh, there was some discussion about rectangles. I really don't use this in my work, um, but it kind of talks about it. And again, it's just geom rect, geom tile, geom roster. The book uses geom tile, but basically all it's doing is it's just creating um, tiles based on your data set that you have. I really don't dig into this too much. If somebody wants to talk more about this, I'm sure can, but I didn't really dig too much into it because I don't really use it very much, so. Cool. Geom text, which is probably something that a lot of us use um, to kind of label, to add labels to our plot. Uh, this is gonna require us to use the label aesthetic. And so usually what we'll have is we'll have a column in our data set that has some type of categorical variable in it that provides some like text data in it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of create a really simplified example because I first tried this with the MPG data and there's just too many different cars and manufacturers in there. So I'm just like, let's look at Ford. Um, so I just did a dplyr pipeline here, MPG, filter it, and then pass it into ggplot2. Um, and because these are invisible or because these are because we can pass these variables on, a neat little trick is, is if you wanted to just do like a really quick dplyr pipeline without creating some type of variable, you can do that and pass it into your ggplot uh, code if you wanted to um, without having to create a separate variable and um, like graying up your uh, working environment. But basically all we're doing here is we're just creating, we're just using geom text here. And then all we're doing is we're just saying, okay, same thing, looking at the relationship between displacement and, and highway mileage for Ford vehicles give me the labels of the specific model type. And so what you're seeing here is ggplot is just plotting the different labels for the different model forward models based on their engine size and highway mileage. You might also probably layer on geome point with this. And um, you might also notice that with geome text, it kind of overlaps. There is some parameters that you can use to manipulate how these get positioned. And so you can kind of dig into those a little bit more, but like you can use like the parameter angle, which will just change the angle of how it is. And then there's some like position dodge, position jitter, position, all kinds of different ways to kind of manipulate how this is, um, how this is actually plotted on the plot to kind of give it some like space. Um, I didn't play around too much with it because I was running out of time, but there's different ways to look at this as well. For things that are simple, I'll probably use geom text, but there are other there are other packages that are available that I think do a better job of if you have to do like a lot of labels. But if you're just something doing something really quick and simple, geom text is the way to go. Usually I'll use this, I'll add on like I'll do like geom point first and then geom text, right? I won't use geom text by itself. Um, but it's just nice to kind of do labeling. So that's the chapter. We got about three minutes left. Um, the exercises, I think, were pretty straightforward. I don't know if we want to spend time talking about that or if we want to dig into um, dig into a topic further, 
or if you just, Gabby, if you want me just to highlight some of the ones that I thought were interesting, um, that's up to you. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you want, was there a specific exercise that was very challenging for you or that you thought, oh yeah, I learned something by doing this? Yeah, there's a couple of them that I thought were kind of interesting that kind of led me down a couple paths. Uh, mm -hmm. The geom bar, geom column one, uh, I finally figured that out. I'll probably still Google it um, because that's just how my brain works. But basically with the geom bar, geom column, geom column is like basically using stat equals identity because it just, you don't have to do that extra step of setting that parameter. It just does it for you. So if you have a data set that you don't want to do any type of aggregation or it doesn't need any type of aggregation, just use GM column, right? Does it matter if you use stat equal identity? No, but it's just like kind of like a shortcut. I'm sure there's more to it than just that, but that's like my main takeaway with GM bar and GM call. So. Other things, obviously, I think this was a bit of a trick question with pie chart. It asks, what GM would you use for a pie chart? Um, you use geom bar, at least in the examples I saw, you use geom bar, but you have to attach on the, the function cord polar. I don't know what all of these parameters do for these. Um, I just like strip the example from it. I would, I don't usually use pie charts. I've been with previous professors. Hey Kaya, thanks for letting me jump forward. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, that was, yeah, I don't really use pie charts. I used to have some instructors that used to like be like, don't use pie charts, there's better ones. Um, I don't know, I think they're useful in certain cases, but going back to the exercise, it's basically like use core polar with your own bar if you have to. And if you do get a chance, look at the documentation for, I think, is it, I think it's core polar. I'm gonna pull it up, but there's like a little note in there that's like, Hadley's favorite pie chart. And it's like, it's kind of interesting to see like a note about like somebody who's like, here's Hadley's favorite pie chart. So I don't know if that was being, um, if that is, uh, if that's the truth or if that's just being satire or whatever. So, but let me see if I can I think he doesn't like that. Or... If I remember seeing this on Twitter somewhere, I think he doesn't like um, pie charts. With me, the thing with pie yeah. charts is, that it's too like it, it there's a place and a situation for them i think like for example newspapers general things on the internet because they're very easy for people to understand that this is a whole and then we divide it in parts so for the general for gen pop right for us in science or even if you're doing research of any kind i feel like it's too simple because the thing is it's just seeing one variable when are we doing that really research is about interpreting the relationship between one between two or more variables so then the, it, there's no place for that there's a specific case of bar charts but they're not with ggplot they you, you use a separate package where you have rings and each ring is a category from the same data so you're in a way comparing bars but sort of like organizing rings i kind of i would be okay with those but the rest which um, yeah. yeah, I think mm -hmm. I've, um, I've used pie charts, a pie, char or pie charts once in one of my publications. And it was literally, it was like setting up, um, I was looking at compare, basically comparing two different sites and looking at the proportion of different, actually I wasn't even looking at different sites. I was looking at the proportion of different, uh, orders of mammals in one mm. locality and then like had a second pie that was just like looking at within the carnivorans, like how many were Smilodon and how many were other just, and it was just like very quick, like, look at a lot of these are not carnivores. And then it was like, look at of the carnivores, all of them, except for like two are Smilodon. So I've used them before, but you can also just do like stacked bar charts to get at the same data, um, which is what I've used pretty much since then. Yeah. Or just yeah. a sentence, right? 50% of the anything 
was this category or 20 was this, yeah. 30 was that, 50 was that. So yeah, yeah so there's some time on a place. Exactly. There's, some, yeah. there's something to be said for visualizing mm. the proportions because yeah, like a lot of people just, especially if you're trying to communicate it with non, a non-scientific audience, people yeah, just like numbers and like brain shut off. <laughs> I think it sh- yeah, it is so easy to understand as opposed to a box plot, for example, that you really need to think about it more. Yeah. So yeah, it's for for things like that, I agree. It's it's good yeah. too. So I could do some so, more digging on this, but here here's the specific, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gabby. No, no, I was gonna say, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so here's the, so here's the, here's the specific Hadley's favorite pie chart. I was gonna do some more digging in, in Git to see who actually put this here, if it was Hadley or not. Um, but here it is, Hadley's favorite pie chart right here, which my assumption is basically someone put this in here because two things. I think a lot of people probably ask that question of like, how do you make a pie chart in ggplot2? And two, I think Hadley, and I'm just assuming, and John, if you're listening, because you're connected with Hadley, ask him what his perspective is on this, because I would love <laughs> to hear. Um, but here's a sidebar, because it was kind of funny at Posit last year, and I should find the video too. Uh, Jenny Bryan was going to give a presentation and Hadley had to step in to talk about it. And it was kind of funny. It's probably, there's a recording of it, but what, what, uh, what Jenny Bryan did was she like put in like a pie chart into the, like into the actual like presentation himself that he had to give. And you could just kind of see like his like, (laughs) thanks Jenny. Thanks for putting this pie chart in here for me. (laughs) So I don't That's know, probably why she put there. it. <laughs> um, but yeah, just a little tidbit that I thought was interesting. But if we have a second, I think there's just one more thing that I think, I don't know, I don't want to mm-hmm. keep people past the time, but um, there was one other thing. You asked the question, Gabby, about like, what was one of the questions that like bothered me the most that I had trouble with? I think exercise three, because I I opened up ggplot2 to conf- these aren't my answers. These were the answers from previous ones. Mm-hmm. I tried to open up. I tried to open up ggplot the code behind it to see if this was true, and I couldn't find this. But the mm-hmm. one interesting tidbit that I did find that John or whoever who's connected to Hadley who can get me connected with him, or maybe I could just post it out into the ether and see if he responds. And this is really, this is like really, really like, this is really getting deep into it, but. GGplot2 has its own object-oriented system that it was built into the package itself. So like if you're familiar with like R6 or S3, those are object-oriented programming methodologies. I don't want to get too far into the weeds of it. But my understanding looking at this, because this is what that led me to, to figure out to confirm those answers, and I couldn't answer it, is, is I found out that GGplot2 has its own object oriented system written into it. And I was just like, whoa, that is crazy. Um, and there's actually a note in here that basically says like, and it's from Hadley that says like, yeah, this is not a really good idea, but this is the least bad solution to solving this because ggplot2 is a legacy code base. And so decisions you make have ripple effects. And so they probably had to make a decision of like, this is the best way to do this. So. I would like to know the story behind this a little bit more. So John, if you're listening to this or if for some odd reason, Hadley, if you are watching this later on down the road, I would really love to kind of get maybe a little bit more info on this um, just out of curiosity. So I think John probably knows if you leave a comment on Slack and say, John, can you watch the last 10 minutes of the recording? Because we have a few questions for you. He probably do it and then he maybe give his answer on Slack. Because um, he, 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 I call, I oftentimes say that he is the first and only so far art historian. So he knows a lot about the history of, because he, he likes it. So he has been, you know, making mental notes about it. So he probably knows about these things. Yeah, it would be, would be nice if he, um, you put it on Slack and then maybe he can, he can answer whatever he watches the recording, right? Um, we need we need but like yeah, a tidyverse archaeologist. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's why I call him the art historian, <laughs> the one and only. So far, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I could probably talk about this all day. So I, I'm already seven minutes over. But um, yeah, I thought this was really interesting. And because it goes back to that question about like, why do we have to use pluses? And why can't we use pipes in ggplot2? It's because, yeah. and th this isn't directly related, but it's like, it's a legacy code base. It was written, you know, Hadley and whoever were, were, was writing the package made choices and those choices you can't go back on. And if you do, there's major ripple effects and people use it. So that's why we will forever see the plus. And it's just interesting to see some of these choices that were made in the past and why they were made. So, but anyways, like I said, I can talk about this all day because I find it interesting. Uh, from John, and I learned that there was an initiative to do a package and they, they started it, but it's abandoned now to do a, I don't remember the name, but it's it's on my foster and, um, because I think I um, uh, I posted it on my on my foster account. But anyway, um, technically there was this project that where they started to do the conversion from pluses to the pipe, so that we could have ggplot with pipes too, so that everything would be coherent. Um, but they abandoned that, and we are forever stuck for at least for the foreseeable future. We're stuck with the plus signs, which I don't mind actually. I kind of like that ggplot is plus and then tidy, or whenever you're just dealing with data frames or tables, you do pipes. I don't know. I, I don't mind it to be honest with you, but, but yeah, you're yeah. right. It's interesting that, that that's the reason, right? Like the, the way they started coding it. Yeah. Ashley, you wanted so the short to say answer is... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Mm, yeah. No, no, no Colin, I... please. I was just oh, saying, whatever. sorry, I'm sorry. Ah, um, go, the, go, go. <laughs> the pluses sort of make sense because because you're adding a layer to the plot, right? Like it just sort of intuitively mm. makes sense. It's literally addition. Whereas like a pipe is, you're not really adding, it's, it's a manipulation, right? It's. Yeah, well, a pipe is like with this, like let's say you mutate, then you yeah. summarize, then you rename, then 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 yeah. right. It's a it's, it's a concatenation of things. Uh, yeah, I like the way you see this because ordered. It's, yeah, the other one is plus a layer plus another layer. It's a series of yeah. You're right. For me, yeah, yeah, I'm so used to it that I I like the pluses, but yeah. <laughs> Colin, you wanted to yeah. say something? It, it's just yeah. So I guess what I was going to summarize is like. I couldn't confirm those answers, but it led me down a path of asking additional questions that I want answers to. But yeah, I don't, I couldn't find, I couldn't find like genome smooth, genome point makes up, or, you know, genome point, genome bo box or whatever makes up these, because when I was digging in the code, I couldn't see it. And that might just be a fault of myself. Cause I just, when I opened it up and I was like, I saw that file and I was like, nah. <laughs> This is too much for me right now, but yeah, that's an unanswered question that I don't have. And it might just be a more general of like, if you were to create this, what would be the geomes that you would use to create a box whisker plot? Oh, you would use geome rect, geome line, whatever it is. So, but that's yeah. all I had to add to that. That's good. Yeah, that, that was a good discussion on geomes. I think it's, um, there's so much to say about geomes. Um, because there are so many intricacies that I have learned along the way, like what you were saying about like putting, for example, a variable divided by another one or putting like a transformation, like a log, an X or something like that into it. Uh, but there's also my favorite thing, which is um, aesthetic things. So you can also do like um, HTML code or something like that in order to control the way the some of the labels are, show up, right? If you want them, for example, a line that you want to break it in, in a line that you want to break it in parts, like for example, for a caption or something, you can also insert HTML um, tags in there. And I wish there was more about that in the book. I've had to learn those, you know, trial and error and seeing how other people are doing that. I'm going to see if at some point I can mention some of those things because I, I don't know, I, I think it's, I like the aesthetics of these graphs, so I think I'm going to start doing that at some point. But so far, thank you so much, Colin, for this discussion. This was great introduction to all the geoms. Um, and yeah, let's let's keep doing all those like little tidbits of like things that we know 
extra things that we know so that we can all be learning from, from each other. Next week, we have when we combine all these genes. So it's like a combination of genes or something. I don't forget the name. And I think it's my turn to present, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, so see you all next week. And if anything, we can keep talking on Slack. Yeah, excellent. I'll see if I can find that video because I know it's recorded. Um, yeah, I'll post it on Slack. Yeah, so, yeah. I will, I will. So I appreciate it. Uh, again, I, right. I, I really, I really appreciate everybody. Let me kind of extend this and push it back. So, but I'm going to work on to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, but I really appreciate everybody being flexible. So thank you. No, of course, Colin, of course. Um, all right.